Okay, well, and, and I also want to uh, thank Lavina for helping us out. And if you would like to start the recording now, that'd be great. I just did. Oh, wonderful. So welcome all to PGSA's online conference. And uh, I'm really excited to have you all here. I'm Joy Meeker. I teach at Saybrook University in the Transformative Social Change Program. And I've also been on the uh, conference committee for PGSA and uh, we're really excited for the offerings that we have in September and October and November and more information on our website for you all to uh, be joining us. And this morning I am excited to uh, introduce three students who also are at Saybrook University in the transformative social change program working on their PhD. And uh, the three people are Janice Jerome, Cassandra Butler, and Gail Humphrey. Each of them have worked together to create this panel. Uh, and I just want to say that I um, am honored to learn alongside them. They are wonderful uh, uh, advocates for social justice, both in their learning and commitments to scholarship, and also um, in the work that they do in this world. So thank you all. And I'm going to start with uh, introducing Janice. Janice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. And Lavinia, thank you for helping me with the slides. I do appreciate it. I'm actually looking at my own slides now, so I already know that you still can see me, so I will be mindful of that. Um, my part is about an overview of restorative justice. Uh, restorative justice is an, has an enormous definition, so there's no way I could present it fully, but um, I'm just gonna give you a little tip of it. And I will miss a lot of things, um, but I want to be respectful for my time and my classmates. And Lavinia, help me out uh, when we get close to that time for me. Uh, I can easily adjust. I'm starting out talking about what is restorative justice. Restorative justice is a philosophy. It's a different way of looking at crime and wrongdoing. It is a social movement here in the United States. Um, to address a lot of the unfairness that goes on in our system. And it's a set of practices. Uh, restored to seek to address harm, needs, who got hurt, what are the needs and obligations. Often you'll see it, it says so that healing can take place, but I often say if things just can be better, that is good. Next slide. I must start out by honoring the Native Americans who share the practices of justice with us. There's been many diverse Native cultures and faith and traditions uh, that are rooted in restorative justice. But the First Nation, the Ojibwe, the Navajo, and many more, um, I believe they should always be honored when you're presenting restorative justice um, platform. Restorative justice is said to have about, be about 40 years old in North America, give or take. Um, however, if you ask me, restorative justice has been around since man has had DNA. Because there's always time in the past where um, communities and leaders had to put down their weapons and talk about what's going on, talk about the conflict. Um, many cultures grab set around trees, they set around fires. You'll see people today in their homes, sitting around their home, trying to address problems. Number three, hopefully it comes up as the basis of restorative justice. Um, yes. In a nutshell, there's many definitions to restorative, but basically it's about crimes or wrongdoings, which are violations of people and relationships. Normally, in our traditional world here, crimes or wrongdoings are called violation of law. But restorative is violations of people and relationships. And the acceptance of the responsibility is required before the process of restor restoration can begin. So there has to be some accountability. Uh, and again, it addresses harm and all those who have an interest in it, including the victims, should be able to have the opportunity to be part of the decision-making. Now, when we go to 
court, uh, the court is there, prosecutor, and the offender. The victim doesn't have to be there. The community doesn't have to be there for them to proceed. But in restorative, they are all included in the decision making. And again, it is a crime against another person, restorative, which, would create, which creates the broken relationships between offender, victim, and their community. Being mindful, it is an alternative framework in the way we think about wrongdoing. It is not the answer to every challenge. Uh, everything does not fit in restorative. And it is definitely victim-centered and offender-sensitive. Next. It should come up um, three different questions. Just kind of looking at it real quick, this is what they call three different questions, criminal justice versus restorative. And criminal justice, it's about what laws have been broken. So if you were stopped by the police, let's say you're speeding, and I've been stopped before. And uh, the first thing, one of the things he do is, before he stopped me, he's already got in mind what law I've broken. And when he comes to my car, he wants to know my ID, who am I? And the only thing left is write me a ticket so I can go to court and be punished. That's it. That's all that's happening in our criminal justice system. But in restorative, it starts with who got hurt, who has been harmed. Then we're going to look at their needs. What are the needs? And whose obligations are these? And the obligation belongs to all those who have interest in what is happening. Uh, the next one, please. Next slide should be... Okay, number five, it should say something about the criminal justice again and restorative justice. And I'm basically saying it again, but in a little different way. Um, the central focus of criminal justice is basically punishment. You get what you deserve. That's it. And restorative, the central focus is the victim needs and the responsibility of the offender for repairing the harm that happened. Um, I know that's a lot um, in just a few minutes, but hopefully as I go down, I can break it down a little bit more, a little plainer. Um, are we on what RJ is not, Lavinia, the next one? Are yes. we there? Okay. Let's just try to do this little picture here. Restorative is not primarily about forgiveness or reconciliation. A lot of people, you know, think forgiveness, forgiveness, you just did restorative. It is rest restorative if harm is addressed. Restorative is not necessarily mediation, but if harm is addressed, restorative comes out of it. It's not definitely, it's not primarily designed to reduce recidivism. Um, a lot of people think, well, you know, we, we got to get so many people from committing a crime. Well, Restorative is not primarily that unless harm is addressed, then restorative comes out of it. It is not a program. Anytime you hear, I have a restorative program, light bulb. Restorative is not a program. It's not something that you write out, you know what's going to happen, blah, blah, blah. It's a process. And you're not attached to an outcome. You don't know what the outcome is going to be. So in a restorative process, um, you have no idea. you got people with relationships violated, conversating. No one knows what's going to happen at the end. If anything, um, it is said that it is a hope that healing takes place, but it might not take place. Um, things may get better, maybe not, but no one knows the outcome. It's not for only minor offenses, rape, murder, all those have been part of a restorative process. Um, but again, let's just say if it's something about rape. Um, every rape victim circumstances might not fit a restorative process. There has to be a lot of preparation to make that decision. It's not new to North America and it's not a solution for the American justice system, definitely. Uh, a lot of people think, well, you know, if I do a circle, then I might not have to go to prison. Nope, it's not an alternative to the prison and it's not necessarily the opposite of retribution. A couple of other things, restorative is not for sale. So if I say, I got this great program that I need for you to do and bring in, er, it's not for sale. It's not something you sell. And it's not a program. It doesn't have a blueprint. 
a protocol. You do this, you do this, and you're going to get that. Mm, not a restorative, because it's about people and conversations, and we're not sure what's going to come out of the respect for dialogue. It's not about getting to the root of a problem. Well, we're going to have a restorative circle so we can get to the root of, whoa, most restorative facilitators are not behavior specialists. They're not necessarily anger management specialists. They're not necessarily psychologists. They can be just plain people like me. So it's not about getting to the root of a problem as much as it's addressing the harm. Because if you're trying to get to the root, you might get a lot of ugly things to come out of a box. And we're not trying to go there if you're given one hour to do a process. So you're trying to address the harm that happens there for that circle. Is Restorative is not a set of tools that is used. So it's not like, well, I'm going to pull out all my restorative tools and we're going to do this facilitation. It is from the way natives do justice. And they do justice based on how they live, not tools in their box. So you're always, in so many words, uh, in a sense, in a restorative manner, if I can keep using that word, um, it is not something that you wait till we all get together and practice. It is an everyday practice in your values. Uh, next slide, number seven, and I'm going to move it a little bit faster. Uh, restoratives. Other names you might hear, it started in the justice system, started, so it started out as restorative, I'm sorry, um, it should have been the top restorative justice, but anyway, it started out as restorative justice. You might hear restorative practice came next, and all the rest came under that to cover many other areas. So these are many ways you might hear, uh, rest well, I've heard it, restorative discipline, transformative justice, restorative and education, relational practice. Um, you might hear many ways it is labeled, but it's all under the restorative justice, restorative practices process. The next one. Uh, in the beginning, I said it was a philosophy. It is a philosophy and it's a social movement, remember? Um, there's just so many things that have come out of the get tough on crime punishment. Um, there are almost 7 million people, adults behind bars on probation or parole. African-American men are in prison six times the rate of whites. Wow. So um, there's a lot going on in our society that is totally unfair. And restorative is part of that movement to hopefully help bring light to it. The next slide, number nine. Now, restorative is a philosophy. It is a social movement and a set of practices. Some of these practices I'm showing, you might have already heard of family group conferencing, which is very popular, especially among social workers and juvenile court systems. Uh, I usually involve the family, support people and all who've been impacted by the wrongdoing. Um, you've heard of mediation possibly, sometimes it's called victim offender mediation and restorative is called victim offender conference. And this is where, um, people get together who have differences through the court system, uh, mostly to talk about, talk and respect for dialogue on how to come to a solution. There's community policing, that's another practice. Uh, in community policing, I think it's a great example of not using a set of tools. Uh, in community policing, it should be based on the value system that drives that person behavior and hopefully there's a very positive value system because all the tools you can give a human being um, does not reflect a restorative process. It is how they live their life and how they carry out their behavior. One of the most popular set of practices is the circle process. Um, sometimes they call them peacemaking circles, um, but the circle process is very popular. Everything, again, in every situation is not a candidate for a restorative circle. There's so much emphasis on preparation to make a decision. So if we're looking at all the racial injustices that we're seeing, everything may not qualify as part of a restorative process. Nothing may not qualify or all could, but it's all based on preparation. 
the next slide. And I'm going to get down to where I will stop talking real soon. So the root circles are one of the common set of practices. And I just wanted to present this drawing by Kay Pranis and Chris Miner. They did it many years ago, and it still holds a lot of um, <clears throat> credibility today. Circles are rooted in shared values, your values. They're rooted in the medicine wheel. Native Americans believe that balance comes in relationships when you are balanced spiritually, physically, emotionally, and intellectually. And also remember the indigenous teachings, circles are rooted in that. And from that, we get community building, healing, and connections. Uh, thank you for that. The next one, number, the next slide should say something about um, the seven core belief. Is that what we have? Yes. Thank you. I had to have some water here. So the seven core beliefs, Native Americans got, oh my God, who knows how many principles and practices they live by. Oh, just buy a book that lists some of them. The book could be so thick. I don't think there's enough books for them. However, um, there are seven here brought together by Kay uh, many years ago, and I'll go through them quickly, but there are the principles that guide restorative circles. The first one is the true self and everyone is good, wise, and powerful. No matter what you did in life, good is in you. Number two, the world is profoundly interconnected. I'm connected to the plants, plants connected to the uh, animals, animals connected to the trees. We're all connected. You hurt one, you hurt the other. Number three, all human beings have a deep desire to be in a good relationship. Basically saying everybody want to be loved. Number four, all human beings have gifts and everyone is needed for what they bring. So Native Americans don't believe that everyone has full gifts and especially when they're young, it's uh, the responsibility of those over them to help them find their full gifts. Number five, and you have four gifts based on Native Americans, and some of us might have found all four, and some not. Uh, I think I found two. I'm looking forward for my other two. Number five, everything we need to make positive changes already here. It's basically saying, if you want something to happen, it won't fall from the sky. You are the one we've been waiting for. Number six, human beings are holistic, and number seven, we need to practice to build habits of living from the core, which goes back to number one. The true self in everyone is good, wise and powerful. The core is good, no matter what happens in life. The next slides, uh, still looking at circles. There's so many types of circles you can do. Um, check up, check in, check up, check out. In the morning, you can check in with somebody. Just say, how are you doing? In the evening, you know, check up. It's still going well, and then, at the end of the day, you know, check out what are your plans, you know, after you leave here. There are talking circles. Talking circles are usually the only circles that you don't have to do consensus decision making. You don't have to make a plan. Community building, school based, sentencing, celebration circles, domestic violence, COSA, uh, circles of support and accountability is what COSA stands for. And there are circles when you need a way of support that can be activated at any time for a person. Uh, family group conference, victim offender conference, decision making, you got pro and problem solving, re entry, planning, reunion racism and bias, anger management, any type of circle you can imagine uh, can be part of a set of practice under restorative. The next slide, um, which is pulling us really close to the end, um, just wanted you to know that there are elements and components of circles. Um, circles start with sitting in space. Um, there's centerpieces. There's value settings, guidelines, a talking piece which is an object that is passed from person to person to give the soul holder permission to speak. There are guiding questions, and of course, there are circle keepers or facilitator. Now, I'll tell you, a circle keeper or a facilitator of a restorative circle only has one job, one job, and that is to keep the circle safe so there can be respect for dialogue. Their job is not to counsel, suggest, refer, recommend, advise, diagnose. That's not a circle keeper or facilitator's job. Only one job, keep the 
the circle safe so there can be respectful dialogue. Um, I call the restore the circles of addressing hard things in a good way. And another thing that I really wanted to point out in restorative circles is it is important that if you're going to address a harm, let's just say something in racial injustice, can you address that harm without creating another harm? You have to think about that. You hurt. How can I sit with you and address my pain without creating pain in you? Um, that's a, a uniqueness of restorative circles. And one of the biggest enemies said to restorative circles is called power and control. And it's not you telling me what power and control looks on me. It's me recognizing what does power and control look like on me. And the times that I've caught myself, I'm like, oh my God. It is one of the biggest enemies of the circle process. So that brings us to the uh, almost the last slide. and. I, I don't know if uh, Joy is still there, if we want to wait for the breakout exercise and let my classmates go. Thank first. you, Janice. I think that's a good idea. Why don't we, okay. and I really appreciate the, the insights that you've shared with us. If you could say one thing about the kind of practice you have done, tell us, because you are a, a renowned restorative practitioner yourself and an author. Um, and I wonder if you could just say a moment about what you know, give us a sense of your background in restorative, and then we'll shift um, to Gail. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I've been doing restorative for about 20 years. I was introduced to it while I was managing court offices in a juvenile court system. Um, I think it's the first time uh, when I was introduced that I cried for real in public because I saw myself. Saw myself. That was amazing. Um, but I've been doing it close to 20 years. I don't specialize because restorative does not change. Some people specialize education, criminal justice, but I don't because it doesn't matter your color, your size, your career. Uh, restorative principles do not change. Um, that everyone uh, wants to be loved. Everyone uh, is good, wise, and powerful, and so forth. So I've had the opportunity to... Um, uh, in my private business to do a, a lot of restorative work with almost any arena that you can name. Um, the arena that I enjoy the most um, is those uh, that uh, I believe um, do not, uh, their self-esteem may be a little low. I enjoy watching people um, see themselves. Um, it's, it's, it just gives me fulfillment. I don't know how much more to say, Joy. I've you know done a lot of things, but what I want people to really know about me is I love the process. It is not the end all to the be all, but it has helped me in life dramatically to see myself. And I think people pay me when I do restorative circles. I'm getting paid to work on myself and be a better person. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janice. And so next we're going to hear from Gail and we'll get a chance to any questions you have for Janice. We'll take them at the end after Gail gets a chance to present and then after her, Cassandra. So Gail. I worked as a probation and parole officer for the state of Missouri for 17 years. Uh, one day, uh, I had a client walk into my office and we'll call her uh, Heather. And long before Heather walked into the room, uh, I knew everything about her. I didn't have to read the story. I didn't have to look at the court documents or the court records. I just knew that she was a convicted felon and that I was there to make sure that she walked the straight and narrow and uh, that she had been given an opportunity uh, to be on probation for five years. Uh, and if she chose to uh, fail to comply with the conditions of probation, she would be sent to prison. Um, I had read the paperwork. I knew that she was um, acting as a prostitute and with two of her accomplices, they would lure men to the uh, local park 
where at gunpoint uh, the men would rob the um, John uh, and, and then all three of them would make uh, get away and, and take the money. Um, my client, Heather, uh, was not sent to prison simply because she didn't have a gun uh, and wasn't using a gun in the perpetration of the crime. So she walks into my office that day and I already knew that I was better than she was because I wasn't a convicted felon. I had never committed a crime um, that I was aware of in my life uh, and knew that I would not ever uh, commit a crime and therefore I was better than she was um, and I knew that in my heart and my mind. Uh, but I had her come into my office and uh, when the first time I saw her, uh, I again had this same uh, message uh, reiterated in my mind as she stood there before me. The blonde hair was piled high on her head, the large hoopy earrings, the tight fitting dress, the stiletto heels, the gum, Everything indicated to me that she uh, was simply there to um, make sure that she didn't end up in prison uh, and that she had really no intention of complying with the conditions of probation that had been set out by the court. I immediately told her to sit down and I said uh, to her, tell me your story. And so she began to tell me her story. She told me about the crime that she had committed. She told me about the things that had, had occurred to her uh, in her home life. How when she was six months old, she had to be hospitalized because her father had beaten her so badly uh, because she wouldn't stop crying that she required medical care. She told me that when she was 18 months old, her father had beaten her again. And when she couldn't control her bowels or her bladder, he would make her stand in it for several hours a day um, and, um, and just stand in it as punishment for what she had done. She was always treated as the, um, the black sheep of the family um, never could do anything that would please him uh, and never made him happy uh, at all. I uh, listened to her story and uh, something occurred within me. I finally realized that in that moment how much and how many assumptions that I carried uh, inside of me. How many judgments and that I had made about other people. And that my idea was that there were some people that just were not redeemable, that weren't good enough and would never be good enough. And in that moment, in that instant, and I don't know exactly what she said, but in that moment, in that instant, um, I realized that had I not received um, the care and the support that I had as a child, I could have found myself growing up on that side of the desk. It was as if all the air got sucked out of my lungs and that I couldn't breathe for a moment. And this realization came to me and my mind went blank. And I, I realized that she was no different than me and that I was no different from her and that we were connected uh, together. And from that point on then, my uh, desire was to help people, to make a difference in their lives and to um, 
make a change that would enable them to be able to live in society as free people. I'm not going to tell you that it was easy because it wasn't easy. I had to go pull her out of um, bars and I had to go to adult bookstores and hunt her down and find her where she was dancing and and you know several times told her that you need to get to my office right away uh, otherwise a warrant will be issued for your arrest uh, and she would come in and we would argue and um, discuss what had occurred but in the end she realized that I was there on her side. And after several years of her being off of probation, I was out in the public one day and um, at a store. And it was our practice not to ever acknowledge an offender or an ex-offender in public so that they would have some privacy. And she walked up to me when I saw her and she had three little boys in tow. And she said, I wanted to tell you how much what you did for me meant to me. And in my mind and to her, I said, I did what I, I needed to do to help you, but I want you to know that you helped me as much or more than I helped you. Because hearing your story caused a transformation to take place within me. And I was restored to being more of the person that I was called to be and designed to be and created to be, to be completely human and full of uh, love and compassion for other people. She really changed my life. And for that, I'm extremely grateful and thankful. Thank you, Gail, for that powerful story of transformation. I want to open up the room to anyone that would like to either express what that story meant for you or if you have a question for Gail. So anyone, you can unmute yourself or if you'd like to put it in the chat. Okay, I would like to talk. Um, I know Gail's story uh, reminds me of uh, a song that that I love, uh, you don't know my story. Because sometimes we as people, you know, we hear things about people, but we don't know what their story is, you know, and and uh, and, it, and it's really something that once we know their story, that a change does come to some people, you know, and I really, uh, that was a great story, Gail. I really enjoyed hearing it. And um, it, it brings back the human compassion that we all should have for each other because uh, we don't know what happened to anybody in their life when they was growing up to make them do the things that they do. So um, that was really great. And, it's, and Janice, I really, uh, I, you know, it, it was really great the way you explained the facilitating and um, the things that you do because they are very important and that's why I just I love this school because you know you learn so much about yourself it's like I found myself you know more of myself since I've been uh, going to Saybrook and you know and I appreciate every one of you and I I just feel like your family because um I know I could see the, the caring faces and I just want to thank everyone, all my professors and, and uh, my classmates, you know, because for one thing, it, it, it's good to have the support. 
So thank you so much. Thank you for the feedback, Sharon. Welcome. Anyone else? I think what we'll do is, Cassandra, let's hear for, from you, and then we'll have a chance to open the room up for dialogue after you speak. And again, thank you, Gail, for your powerful story. First childhood memory, I asked him, hmm, he says, well, when I was four or five years old, I remember my mom shooting one of the men that used to hit her. In this moment, I paused, thinking, this has got to be an extraordinary story because how could this be anyone's first childhood memory? He continues, we, my brothers and I, were at the house with my mom and they were arguing and fighting. She yells at us to go in the bedroom, so we go, of course, but continue peeking through the crack of the door as they continue screaming at each other. He hits her. He hits her hard. She falls to the ground and there's a brief pause. Then my mom gets up and runs towards the room we're in. We quickly move from behind the door. In this moment, I'm pausing. I think this has got to be the part of the story where his mom's running in, she's closing the door, she's locking it, and the police are being called, right? No. This is the part where it gets worse. He continues his story to tell me, my mom reaches up into the closet and she grabs her gun. Now this man must have known what was coming to him because he's already running out the door. Curious, we follow our mom out of the room and then she gets money, he says, explaining in the most casual way that his mother just shot another human being in front of his eyes. And I remember this vividly, not even crying, he says, because this was so normal to me. I laugh at the end of his story, not because it's funny, but because he tells a story and speaks so casually that it's as if he's talking about family dinner on Sunday, and I'm not sure how to emotionally respond. He says, you haven't heard anything yet. There's so much more. Hey everyone, my name's Cassandra. I am a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a soon to be grandma. I'm a social justice warrior, a prison abolitionist and an advocate of true social change. But today I wanna to talk to you a little about restorative justice and what it should look like from an inside out perspective. Now, as we continue and before we finish this story, I want to give you a few definitions. You can go to the next slide. First, the definition of trauma. The definition of trauma is a deeply distressing and disturbing experience as a result of a distressing, or sorry, and or physical injury. The definition of psychological trauma is damage to the mind that occurs as a result of a distressing event. And the definition of intergenerational trauma is a psychological term which asserts that trauma can be transferred in between generations. After a first generation of survivors experience trauma, they are able to transfer their trauma to their children and further generations of offspring via complex post-traumatic stress disorder mechanisms. Trauma is often the result of an overwhelming amount of stress that exceeds one's ability to cope or integrate the emotions involved with that experience. The slide that you're looking at and the um, titles that are on the slide are the headlined news stories for the mother, the father, the uncle, the brother, all of this child in the story. Of course, in telling you these definitions, I'm not telling you all anything you don't know. We're all here at this conference as scholars, educators, and academics that have heard these definitions many times. I wanted them to be fresh in your mind as we continue this conversation about what restorative justice should look like. What is restorative justice? Well, according to the principles of restorative justice, crime causes harm and justice should focus on repairing that harm. The institutions believe people most impacted by the crime should be able to participate in its resolution. So who is impacted by this crime? The program specifically used by the Washington State Department of Corrections is called the Bridges to Life Program. 
this program holds an expectation that inmates learn firsthand about the pain that crime causes families, asserting that many inmates start off thinking their crime is a victimless one, but through hearing their victim stories, learning responsibility, accountability, confession, repentance, forgiveness, and all the other life skills, their outlook is suddenly changed. This gives them hope for a better future and creates determination not to repeat past mistakes. Department of Corrections believes you do all these things, they give you a certificate, off you go, repented, repaired, with the piece of paper to prove it. Now let me tell you what's wrong with this model. First, let's go back to the story. Who exactly is the victim in that story? Is it the abused woman? Is it the man who's outside shot and bleeding? Or is it the room full of children who were just a witness to both? And whose responsibility is it to repair all of that harm? Does our legal system repair that? Does Department of Corrections repair that? Are our own communities equipped to repair that? The Department of Corrections would have you believe that through institutional accountability, confession, and forgiveness, peace is restored. But what happens when you take your certificate, you go back to the streets after release? What happens to that harm from the story, the harm that was never repaired? What happens is that folks come home from prison unequipped and unprepared and return to the institution. This is the setup. For a year, I volunteered inside the Washington State Department of Corrections at multiple institutions. And during my volunteer time, I had the pleasure to work with many members of an organization known as the Black Prisoners Caucus. The Black Prisoners Caucus is an anti-racist organization started in the 70s that among many things, has developed an education program called TEACH. This stands for Taking Education and Creating History. Now, what makes this education model so special is that an education model like this is completely built and developed by incarcerated individuals. All classes are facilitated by incarcerated individuals, including classes in which folks receive college credits. And there are no institutional barriers set up in receiving education. This educational model is open to all incarcerated folks, no matter what your sentence or your sentence length. Now this varies greatly from the Washington State Department of Corrections rehabilitation education model, which says that you have to be seven years from release in order to qualify to attend an education program. So for folks like my husband who on paper has 10 more years to do, or my brother who's currently serving a life without the possibility of parole sentence, this means no education programming. The problem with this is that what do folks do when they are released? My husband, now eligible for review and possible early release, without the TEACH program is released with no education. My brother, who is sentenced under the three strikes law for crimes that now are not even strikeable offenses, also has a good chance of being released and without TEACH would be released after almost 17 years of incarceration with only nine months in those 17 years outside of an institution, having no education. This is what Department of Corrections calls rehabilitation. This is where you take institutional restorative justice, you get your certificate, you work a job, they pay you $1 per hour, and they release you with a good luck and a see you soon. This is the prison industrial complex, and this is what's wrong with institutional restorative justice. During my volunteer time, I was fortunate enough to attend many classes facilitated by members of TEACH. Many classes teaching an inside out version of restorative justice, a version of restorative justice that begins with the healing of the wounds of self, a version in which conversations were rich with intelligent minds and forward thinking that had been held back in life because of what can be referred to as learned helplessness. Learned helplessness occurs when people feel that they have no control over their situation. They begin to behave in a helpless manner. They accept that this is their life and things are not meant to be different. Learned helplessness is often something we, are, we see starting in childhood. When a child is in need of help and it never arrives, they feel like what they're experiencing is just normal. As they grow and continue to experience these things, this increases their feeling of helplessness and hopelessness, and they settle into this feeling through adolescence and into adulthood, accepting their circumstances as the norm. 
Children experiencing learned helplessness often will fail to ask for help and become frustrated easily, suffering from anxieties and depressions throughout life. Remember the kid from the story? He was not even phased by watching his mother shoot someone right in front of him at the age of four or five. So can you imagine what he has seen up to that point that's normalized this for him? Next slide. The trauma that this child has endured has made him a victim. Surrounded by many situations out of his control that adversely affected him and eventually will cause him to weaponize his situation. He will react quickly, remain fearful, passive and insecure, staying in bad situations and never choosing to make change because this is where he is comfortable. As a victim, he more than likely feels powerless in his everyday life. How many of us have been in a situation where we feel powerless? We also can begin to weaponize our situations, never choosing to be involved or take part in potential opportunities because we feel powerless. This is what we call the victim mind state, a mind state that enslaves your mind, a part of the post-traumatic slave syndrome. During slavery, to learn to read and write and to be educated could mean being sold off in the least and at the worst it could mean death. Because of the trauma slaves endured, most slaves never bothered to learn how to read or educate themselves. On the other hand, the slaves and their families that were educated had to adapt to acting as if they were dumb, never allowing the world to see what they were actually capable of. This form of generational trauma, along with other things for generations in Black families, has perpetuated a cycle of learned helplessness and victim mind state to the point of cultural acceptance. Today, young people in our communities are bullied or made fun of if they choose to go to school and educate themselves. They're referred to as a square. Their peers allege that education is not a trait held in our communities. Because so many of this, these young people accept their circumstance as the norm, they put themselves in these situations where they feel powerful in a sense of control. Situations that look like participating in gang activity, committing crimes where they're in control, situations that they believe will lead them to a more powerful point, a, a way to provide a life that is different from the environment they were raised in. This is how the victim mind state prevents us from achieving our personal freedom. The failure of the institutional restorative justice programs to recognize the victim mind state of those perpetuating crimes means they fail to rehabilitate him, them. In doing so, they fail. The good news is none of this is permanent. Next slide. The first step to, to a restorative justice path that will work is identification of the mind state. Becoming conscious and aware of the trauma you've been through and how you've perpetuated this trauma on your victim is recognition of the victim mind state. Really thinking about what's going on what you're doing, how the situation could continuously affect you in the long run if the right choice is not made. You have to decide to make a change, but change doesn't just happen. Change, change is a choice. Realizing the solution is within you. A person who is a victim and not ready for change will struggle to accomplish this because they have a desire to be rescued, but you have to look at your life completely and ask yourself if this desire is to maintain your mind state. If so, it's time to create the solution and make a change. All of our responses to life, all of our states of mind are totally within our control. You have to choose self-empowerment. You have to choose education. You have to choose the change that you want to be. These are restorative justice practices. These are the restorative justice practices taught by these men and women inside, facilitated in a way where they really hear each other. They walk similar paths to recognition together. They discuss where they're at in life and where they wanna be. This is the only true path to restorative justice. Next slide. Oh yeah. And for those of you who want to know what happened to the kid from the story we started with, he is my husband and partner in this life. After going to prison at the age of 19, receiving a 20 year sentence, the first time he was ever sent to prison, he went in with the same victim mind state he had lived with his whole life. One day he woke up in solitary confinement after being sent there multiple times and realized that this was not going to be the path he continued on. 
From that point on, he's devoted his time and effort to educating himself. He developed a curriculum in which he teaches this very same information to other incarcerated individuals inside and builds restorative practices in a way that Department of Corrections never could. This is what we call our conversations of growth. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your powerful stories, Cassandra, as well as your analysis and uh, such a vivid contrast between the violence of institutionalized restorative justice and how that has been abused and the powerful and transformative work that you're a part of. I want to open the floor, open the circle to anyone that has a comment or a question for Cassandra to begin with and then we'll open the discussion for the panelists as a whole. Any thoughts or uh, appreciation, especially for the, the participants? Cassandra's share. Cassandra, I'd like to thank you for your story. Of course, it's the first time I heard it. I always wonder why you just so busy. You, every time I talk to you, you're driving a car somewhere. Now I kind of get it a little bit. You're on a beautiful mission, beautiful partnership. And I, all I can say is I love it. I love it. I love it. That's it. Thank you for that. And for Gail, this is the first time I heard all the parts to the story and i appreciate you too gail the way you delivered it so elegant very beautiful tone thank you gail for allowing me to hear the rest of your story i i just they're, they're all restorative rooted in values and and teaching and people and humans and how we relate they are all perfect beautiful examples of restorative lives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janice. Anyone else with comments and questions for the panelists? Um, I wanted to say uh, to Cassandra, I can relate to her story because I have a brother that's in prison and he's doing life. And it's, it's really stressful, you know, and um, we must never give up hope because I still don't believe that he's going to do life. And I always tr do everything I can to help him because I know he was young when he made mistakes and he's been in uh, prison for over 20 years and it doesn't take 20 years for anybody to learn anything, especially, you know, if they were put in there when they were young. And now he's in his 50s. So um, I, I just uh, want to thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. You're welcome. Other questions or comments for the panelists? Or Gail, did you have something? I did. Actually, I wanted to ask Cassandra a question. So. In the state of Washington, the Washington Department of Corrections has a system or a program that runs parallel to the program that you're advocating. Um, there are two separate programs. So, I mean, um, have there been any problems with well, that's the first question. The second one then is, have there been any problems with um, instituting the um, offender-led uh, program or programming uh, from the Department of Corrections that you've recognized? Um, yeah, so um, the Black Prisoners Caucus TEACH program is currently only in three institutions of the 12 that are in Washington State. Um, this is due to um, pushback from the Department of Corrections. So the institutions that, these pro that this specific education model is in are only institutions in which the superintendent has chosen um, to kind of welcome that program in, um, but the others have not yet decided to let it in. So um, 
even with the restorative justice program, the Bridges to Life program, that's only in 50% of the institutions that are in Washington State. It's mainly in the uh, minimum camp institutions or the medium minimum institutions because um, of the rules here and the um, inability to program if you have less than seven years or if you have more than seven years till your release date. If you don't have a release date, you're never eligible for programming. So um, in the institutions where this specific teach model has been um, instituted, anyone is eligible um, regardless of your sentence. And so it has been the only way for some folks to receive education, but again, it's totally up to the superintendent of that prison. So it's just kind of, you know, who, who in Department of Corrections is forward thinking enough to realize that these folks are human beings and not just caged animals. Well, Cassandra, are the people allowed to, are uh, outsiders coming into the prison to start the Black Prison uh, Caucus, I think? Uh, because isn't Bridges to Life about, I'm uh, maybe 30, maybe 20 something years old, 30? How, long, how old is Bridges to Life? Because I think I knew one of the founders, um, a BP Corporation uh, executive, was one of the founders, Bridges to Life. How old is it, Bridges to Life? I think it is about 30 years old. Bridges to Life started in Texas, and it's just yeah. the model that Washington State chose to adopt um, because Washington State Department of Corrections lacks creativity and can't figure out their own model. So we just grabbed onto someone else's and used that um, in the least helpful way possible. So. so is the Black Prison Caucus, how is that, I mean, how do you, who's leading that? The prisoners themselves? So, yes, the Black Prisoners Caucus is led exclusively by incarcerated individuals. Um, it is a Black-led organization. Um, all folks are welcome to education. All folks are also welcome to the Black Prisoners Caucus um, membership and meetings. Um, the Black Prisoners Caucus ex itself is actually in all 12 institutions, um, but it is separate from its, the TEACH model um, so not all institutions have now allowed a Black Prisoners Caucus chapter, which does um, anti-racist organizing. They hold legislative summits. They hold youth and family summits. They're doing um, a lot of work with community and in community from the inside out. Um, but only three so far have been able to bring forth the TEACH model. Thank you. Cassandra, um, for those who, before we get a chance to uh, read your dissertation, <laughs> uh, can you suggest any other places that we could find information on this? Because it's such a powerful model. Um, the Black Prisoners Caucus has a website, um, and I know that it's under construction, um, so you can look there. They're, what they're working on is developing um, a website for each chapter because we were um, able to um, the Black Prisoners Caucus was able to just get cross-prison phone calls um, allowed. And so now each chapter's representative from each chapter are allowed to talk to each other via monitored phone lines um, so that they're all working collectively on um, the same issues and moving forward in, in a collective way. So I know that um, there was some effort to separate each chapter um, online, but they do currently have a website where you can read um, about them. The Village of Hope also is an anti-racist organization here in Seattle um, that has a strong relationship with the Black Prisoners Caucus. They have a website that also has information related to the BPC. Thank you. So uh, questions or comments for the panelists as a whole? So I'm going to invite you to either unmute yourself and speak the question or if you or, or comment um, or you're welcome to put it in the chat. Chat box disabled. 
think the chat is available for folks. Okay. If anyone's having trouble, then just feel free to speak your question or comment. I've enabled it now, so it should work for everyone. Thank you. So I have a question for Gail. Gail, if in reflection, and it was a, such a powerful story of transformation. So thank you for um, sharing that with us. And in reflection of it, what do you think helped enable you to have that kind of uh, transformation? If there's anything that you can think of in terms of like what either prepared you or how do you make sense of it? I know you've looked at transformative learning theory a bit and you've looked at some other angles of um, understanding transformation. Is there any thoughts on that you have that you would like to share with us? Um, I think one of the, the major thoughts that I had was um, I was always of the opinion that I was different from them and separate from them. That um, I can remember as an example, I had a, an offender who was a sex offender and um, I had pulled him into my boss's office to talk uh, to him and the offender said, um, well, you know what it's like. You have a, a 15 or a 16 year old stepdaughter and she's all dressed up and, and made up and everything. And you get, you know, you get turned on by it. And he go, my boss said, um, I wouldn't get turned on by that. And you and I are nothing alike and I will never be like you. And it was that kind of mentality, I think, that I carried deep within myself as well, that I was different than they were. There was something um, about um, those people that made them different. And when she shared her story with me over about an hour and a half period of time, it just all of a sudden it just hit me that um, there wasn't any difference. And, you know, because um, I hadn't been convicted of any crimes, I sure had done some stuff that if people had known about, I would have, I could have been convicted of a crime, you know. And I finally realized in that moment that I wasn't any different than she was. And it was that, that melding together of, of realization that caused me to just have everything stop in that moment and uh, transform the way that I saw the world. I mean, it was it was totally different as opposed to living in a, in a cube in my mind that was so neat and clean and orderly. All of a sudden my mind was opened up to this possibility that I wasn't any different. And, you know, had I not received the support that I had I could have been right exactly where I was at, at that moment. And it was such a powerful revelation in that moment that it changed me uh, forever. Um, prior to that time, I had placed many, many people uh, in jail. And my friends and coworkers used to joke around that I needed my own wing of the Jackson County Jail there in Kansas City because I had so many people incarcerated there. Um, and it almost instantly went from that to doing everything that I could to restore and reconcile people uh, to themselves and to the people 
you know, that had been harmed, um, you know, it just changed my behavior. It changed my outlook. It changed everything about me. It was such a powerful experience. I haven't had uh, any other experience in my life that was that powerful. Thank you. I think it's so common that we, uh, it's uncommon to hear uh, that level of transformation through a, a story. And so I appreciate the vulnerability that it takes for both for you to share that and also the insights it gives us in terms of the hope and possibilities um, from, in this case, from storytelling or from your deep listening to another that opened the possibility of um, truly empathizing with her. If there's anyone else who has a question or a comment for the panel, I'll give a moment for us to listen to that. And then Janice, if um, what, uh, let's, let's see if anyone does I'll give a moment. And if not, Janice, what we can do is we can move to that taste of practice that you had set up for us. But let's take a moment first to see, is there anyone that would like to either offer uh, a comment or a question to any of the panel members? Okay, so, and if any ideas come up, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll come back to them at the end of the session. Um, at this point, I think I'm going to uh, suggest that we stop the recording and move because we won't be able to record um, the small group session. So I want to first of all, just thank you all for participating and we can close off the recording and then we'll move into a taste of practice.